My name is Reina Penelova. I'm the Senior Analyst and Portfolio Manager here at Hightower Las Vegas. And I'm joined here today by Adam Thurgood, our Managing Partner. Uh, thanks for joining us for our October 2022 client briefing. This time around, we titled it The Inflation Fight. And for obvious reasons, really. We've all been tackling inflation one way or another, and markets haven't been excluded from that. Uh, when we were preparing this presentation, we came across a quote that really resonated with us and what we're experiencing right now. It's by Sun Tzu, who famously wrote The Art of War. So what he said is that the supreme art of war is to subdue your enemy without, a, without fighting. And this is what the Fed had a chance to do with inflation. They had a chance to subdue it when inflation was still weak, but they failed to do so. So now they're being forced to fight a war and they're dragging markets across, uh, uh, they're dragging markets with them. When we look at the equity markets, they've been feeling the pressure all year long. All the major indices are down. These are the US indices, but even internationally, uh, stocks are down and the pain hasn't been limited to stocks. Bonds have also been feeling pain. The aggregate bond index is down about 15% for the year. And that's quite unusual for periods when stocks are feeling pressured. So why are bonds uh, doing so bad? When we look at inflation, inflation is it's really skyrocketing. Um, the period uh, immediately before the great financial crisis, inflation was trending for a long time at about 2.7%. After the great financial crisis, uh, it ticked down to 1.7%. Even some economists were worried about deflation and the effects that would have on the economy. Well, fast forward to the pandemic, we had unprecedented amounts of stimulus injected in the economy. We were faced with supply chain disruptions. And as a result, we are now facing inflation of around 7.3%. Uh, this is not something that the Fed can tolerate, and as a result, they need to be raising rates and therefore causing pain for the bond markets. In fact, the standard portfolio mix of 60% stocks and 40% bonds is now having its worst year since 1937. Uh, that's quite something, really. Uh, and when we look at inflation, it's really pervasive across the board. Um, energy is really leading the charge. It's quite elevated. And when you have energy staying high for an extended period of time, it tends to trickle down through other parts of the economy. We can see food inflation is also going up quite a bit. And that has an added headwind by from and that comes from the war in Ukraine, which has caused fertilizer prices to skyrocket. Uh, so what all that boils down to is the cost of living is going up sharply and everybody has to deal with inflation one way or another. In short, the economy needs help. And we do think that help is coming. It's just not the type of help the economy really wants. And Adam is going to explain more on that front. Yes. So we are dealing with elevated levels of inflation and unfun time in financial markets and Help is on the way, but as Raina said, it's not the kind of help that the economy really likes. And that help is coming from a slowdown in housing. It's coming from what we think will be an election that splits power in Washington. It's coming or will come from a contraction in the labor market. And then, of course, Fed policy is very restrictive at this point in time. So let's go through each one of these and get a sense of what's going on and how each of these individually will help to cool inflationary pressures. Well, housing is one of the, the most important components of the economy for various reasons, especially the knock-on effects uh, that new home construction brings. And home builder sentiment is one of the most leading indicators that we watch. Home builder sentiment leads economic activity by about 15 to 18 months. And what we've seen so far this year is an absolute plunge in sentiment amongst home builders. We're down to levels that we haven't seen really since 2008. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're in anywhere near the same level of danger as 2008. That was a different environment that was characterized by extremely over indebted uh, homeowners. The, the consumer is in better shape today than they were back then. But nevertheless, home builder sentiment is down, which means that will likely see construction activity cool off. And that's exactly what we're seeing with new home purchases. 
and existing home purchases, they've trailed off. But more importantly for it, the inflationary outlook is what's happening with building permits. Building permits skyrocketed once we reopened and they've now come down sharply. And when we think about what building permits mean, less building permits today mean less construction in the future. That obviously creates less demand for the raw materials that go into housing. But housing itself has knock-on effects. If you buy a new home, you also need durable goods, the big ticket items like a refrigerator or a washing machine. You also spend money on window coverings and new pieces of furniture that might go in certain spots of the house that was different from your last house. So as building permits slow and construction activity slows, that also has knock-on effects to the rest of the economy. And as we know, someone's spending is someone else's income. So as building permits and construction activity slow, that means that down the road, several months or quarters, we also see a slowing in overall economic activity, all else being equal. Now, affordability is one of the main drivers for this slowdown. It's absolutely plunged, and that's as uh, a result of really high prices. Post-COVID, we saw home prices skyrocket, but we've also seen the 30-year mortgage rate go from about 2.8% in early 2021 to over 7%, and we're just at about 7% today. That's an enormous change in less than a few years, and it's caused the affordability for the average person to go way, way down. And until we see mortgage rates fall or home prices correct, this housing slowdown is going to be with us for a while. So to recap housing here, less activity, less construction, less demand for goods, that should put downward pressure on inflation. And on to the election, our favorite time of year when we're inundated with terrible TV commercials and junk mail and never ending calls to participate in polls. Uh, we find this fall period to be both entertaining because it's football season, but also annoying because of all the, the, <laughs> the stuff that comes along with elections. But this election has quite a bit of importance, we think, for the inflationary outlook for the next couple of years. Let's start with the odds of what we think might happen. If we look at the odds that are being projected for the balance of power in Washington, there are about 40% odds, maybe a little bit higher, that the Republicans will sweep and they'll control both the House and the Senate. There are roughly equal odds that the Republicans will take the House and Democrats will take the Senate or keep the Senate. And what we notice here is the lowest probability outcome is that Democrats take the House and Republicans take the Senate. And the reason that has basically a 0% chance of happening is because the odds that the Republicans take the House are enormous. And so what this tells us is that there are high, high odds of at least split Congress in Washington, and that should lead to gridlock. And gridlock means tightening our fiscal belts. There won't be as much stimulus coming from the federal government if Republicans and Democrats can't agree, uh, which seems to be par for the course these days. Uh, but with one of them in complete power, you can still get activity uh, across the finish line. We don't think that that is very likely going forward. Now, we do have the, the one nuance here where because Democrats control the, the Congress and the presidency, there could be some activity in the lame duck session after the election in between uh, the election and, and when those new senators and congressmen are are uh, taking their new seats. And if there's some major stimulus package that gets pushed in, in between you know, early November and mid-January, that could change our outlook on what the what might happen with the inflationary picture going forward. Uh, but at this point, we don't see a huge chance of a major stimulus package just because inflationary pressures are still pretty high. So all else being equal, the election should put downward pressure on inflation. Now let's talk about the labor market. This is where it gets more tricky and it's not as clear cut. Uh, the labor market saw an enormous surge of job openings in the post reopening era of mid 2021 and onward, but we did not see an equal size surge in the number of people that were looking for employment that still needed a job. And so what we ended up with was a ratio of the number of job openings to unemployed workers that soared to two, two open jobs for every unemployed worker. It's since come back to about 1.7 after last month where we saw a million unopened 
uh, unfilled jobs go away. Uh, but still at 1.7 open jobs per unemployed worker, that is a significant number and puts a lot of pressure on companies to pay more in order to attract talent. And that rise in, in wage pressure is what has the Fed worried. Now, why did this happen? Well, a lot of different reasons. But one of those is early retirement. If we look at the labor participation rate of those 55 and older, what we see is that for about a decade, it was fairly steady in the, the low 40% range. COVID hit, obviously it went down for a variety of reasons, but it hasn't really recovered all that much. So this could be due to this cohort retiring early because they were close to retirement, asset prices went up, maybe they felt comfortable pulling the plug early. It could be because people are afraid to go back into an office environment with COVID around. There could be a, a variety of reasons, but the fact of the matter is, is that participation rates have not come back up, which causes a big gap in the number of workers that should be in the labor market. And this is why we have wage pressure, not just because of retirees, but because there are too many open jobs for the, the number of people that are looking for them. For a long time, wage inflation was somewhere between two and 4%. And since we reopened in 2021, we've seen a surge in wage growth. Now we're tracking almost at 7%. And that's just simply inconsistent with the Fed's mandate of a 2% inflation target. So the Fed is laser focused on tightening labor market conditions so that the or sorry, they're, 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 <laughs> they're focused on making the labor market less pro-worker and, and not as inflationary. And they're doing this for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into in a second. But what we're seeing is as wages rise, it creates a negative feedback loop that the Fed is terrified of. When people get a raise, that means that that expense is coming from somewhere and it usually is coming from a business having a lower profit margin. Businesses are run by people that like to make money. So they look at their P&L after a few months and say, wow, costs are up, wages are up, I need to raise prices. And that increase in prices across the board causes purchasing power for the average worker to decline. And so a couple months go by and they go back to their boss and say, look, I need a raise or I, I have to jump ship and take a higher paying job somewhere else. And this is a reinforcing loop that is very dangerous for the inflation area outlook and, and what happens in the economy. And that's why the Fed is so adamant to try and slow down what's happening with wage inflation. The Fed has been very clear, more clear than I think we've ever seen a Fed, that they are trying to bring down asset prices and they're trying to increase unemployment. In fact, at the Jackson Hole Summit, which is uh, where central bankers gather to give speeches and talk policy, Chairman Powell of the Fed said, while higher interest rates, lower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, it will also bring some pain to households and businesses. I've never heard a Fed chairman be so direct about causing pain in my entire 20 plus year career. You'd have to go back into the 70s and early 80s when Paul Volcker was really trying to tame inflation to have anything close to this level of directness about causing pain to the economy. So it's a really interesting environment. And so what's been happening is the Fed is pressing on the brakes very hard. We've seen the Fed funds rate go from zero up to over 3% now. And there's another 1.25% kind of baked in the cake before the end of the year. What we find really interesting is that the Fed funds rate uh, lags the two-year yield by about six months. And the two-year yield is already pricing in a Fed funds rate north of 4%. So we think the Fed has more hikes in their system. We'll probably see 0.75% in November and maybe even a, another half a percent in December unless something causes them to shift gears. Now, what could that be? Well, liquidity conditions have tightened dramatically. As the Fed has raised rates and, and more importantly, as they've started to tighten uh, and, and reduce their balance sheet, that has caused liquidity conditions to come down, which causes financial conditions to become pressured. And that causes all sorts of, of global stress in the financial system. Now, the Fed doesn't want to cause a global financial crisis, but they also want to tame U.S. inflation. And what we're seeing is in the global uh, markets, the rise of the dollar is causing severe stress. In fact, 
three of the major currencies of the world, the euro, the yen, and the British pound are down 15 to 20 plus percent. Those are massive moves for currency markets. And it's happening because the Fed is the most aggressive central bank trying to tame inflation. When they do that, the dollar increases relative to other currencies. And there are other factors that, that go into it. But the Fed is basically caught between a rock and a hard place because what they are, are doing is focused on taming U.S. inflation. That causes the dollar to be higher because they're more hawkish than other central banks. And ironically, a higher and stronger dollar actually helps bring down U.S. inflation. But at the same time, a stronger dollar causes all sorts of stress in the global financial system because it is the reserve currency of the world. So the Fed is walking a delicate tightrope between trying to bring down U.S. inflation, but not pushing too hard and ending up causing some sort of a crisis internationally. Now, when we look at all these effects combined, we do think inflationary pressures come down. Housing is clear cut to us. It's going to slow and that's going to cause less demand for resources. We believe the election is as much of a done deal as, as we can expect that there will be a, a uh, split of power in Congress. The labor market still has work to be done. It's slightly negative at this point, uh, but we think because the Fed's policy is so restrictive that eventually it will feed through into the labor market. So we do see inflation pressures easing a bit. That doesn't mean that we'll be back to zero to 2% inflation. We can see a high probability of getting between say four and five or maybe even 6% inflation in the next six to 12 months. But it's going to be much more difficult to get from there down to the uh, overall target of 2%. So this has been a really challenging period for the economy. It probably gets more challenging for the economy as we look ahead. Uh, and it's created a lot of anxiety for investors and a lot of stress in financial markets. And we've spent a lot of time studying markets and analyzing portfolios to try and position ourselves to, to uh, best protect investors as we move forward. And Raina is going to talk more in detail about what those moves have been and, and what we think going forward. That's right. You're probably wondering, what have we done to protect portfolios? And we've really been operating in the spirit of who we'll either make, uh, will either find a way or will make a way. So if you're familiar with our client briefings and you've watched the previous uh, editions, you probably also know that we've been wary of uh, possibly higher inflation, uh, creating a higher interest rate environment and how that is going to ripple through markets and more importantly, through our portfolios. So in 2020, we set out to do a new, to create a new allocation strategy called the Defender. You might be familiar with it if your advisor has already talked to you about it. They will do that if they think that it's suitable for you or it's going to achieve, help achieve your financial plans goals. But basically the Defender is a more diversified all weather portfolio, uh, more broadly diversified than the standard 60-40 mix. Um, so that's how we've made our own way. Also, we're actively managing risk. This time around, uh, this year, you're probably noticing a lot more trades in your accounts. Also, when it comes to actively managing risk, we've started way back in 2019 in our bond portfolios as well. We started limiting credit risk by adding more treasuries in our bond portfolios. We also are keeping our average maturity down, therefore limiting the sensitivity of the bond portfolio to uh, rising interest rates. Uh, and one more thing that we're doing that's new this time around is using tactical hedging. Uh, these are short-term um, short positions that we add to portfolios when we believe that there's a higher probability of volatility picking up. Uh, these are products that tend to go up when stress in the market is present. Uh, so you could see these coming in and out of your portfolios uh, now and then. So what have what has all these produced, what are the results? Let's go through our account analytics report. Uh, this plots the risk versus return trade-off for our portfolio for the last 12 months and compares it to some indices. So this is our diversified growth portfolio. It's our all equity strategy that we've been managing for many years. 
And we can see that in the last 12 months, uh, the diversified growth has been able to deliver lower volatility and better results than both the S&P 500 and the All Country World Index. Let's also look at the Defender. We just talked about the Defender. Um, so that's our newest strategy, more diversified. It's also been successful at um, delivering and mitigating volatility and uh, delivering better results, even though still negative over the last 12 months uh, compared to many indices. Uh, so overall, it's been a very tough year. Uh, we've been successful at dampening volatility, but what we have to focus on is the big picture. What, what all of you are really worried about is, are you going to be able to, to achieve your goals? And the best way to be reassured that you have a good probability of doing that is by checking on your financial plan. If you're our client and you have a financial plan and that financial plan has a high prob probability of success, then uh, you should know that a drawdown such as the one we're experiencing right now is already factored in. And how is it factored in? It's uh, by taking your uh, financial plan through what's called a Monte Carlo simulation. So Monte Carlo simulation takes your financial plan and um, stress tests it through hundreds of different scenarios. Some of these scenarios include much better markets than the one we have today, but some of them uh, include much more drastic slowdowns, much more protracted slowdowns too. And if at the end, your financial plan still has a high prob probability of success, then you could be reassured that what we're experiencing right now um, has been anticipated. Uh, but in addition to that, we have seen this movie before. Markets experience, experience sell-offs once in a while. Uh, this is the S&P 500, and this chart looks very familiar, very similar to the one we have today, actually. But it ends in 1962. It was another year when we experienced a sharp sell-off. Uh, and let's fast forward to 1987. Many of you probably remember uh, that sell-off in Black Monday. And uh, 1987 also was a period of uh, stress in equity markets. But when we look at 1962 in comparison, it looks like just a blip on that chart. And then when we fast forward to today, and the chart looks very very similar to the ones from 1962 and 87, uh, we can see that um, we've experienced drawdowns like this before. But when we look from the distance of time, previous drawdowns are really barely registering on the chart right now. So uh, we can conclude that if you're invested in high quality investments, uh, in high quality securities and portfolios overall, then time is really your ally. And uh, when we speak of time, uh, we're actually entering a period of time that's historically been associated with positive returns for equities. Uh, what I'm talking about is the period right after midterm elections. Usually midterms produce a gridlock in the government and stock markets tend to like that. Of course, um, so ever since 1950, in every instance, the period of 12 months immediately after midterm elections has had positive stock market returns. Of course, these outcomes vary widely. Some of them are barely positive. Uh, some of them are as positive as 35%. We don't know how it's going to go, and we don't know if uh, this year maybe it's an outlier. Maybe it doesn't play out the same way. What we do have confidence in is that the best way through is uh, the best way out is always through. We are here every day. Uh, we're monitoring markets, analyzing them, and doing our best to make decisions with the information that we have at the time. And we really believe that our portfolios are well structured and prepared for the challenging the, for the challenges that we're currently facing. So thank you very much for your time. And as always, please don't hesitate to call us or reach out with any questions or comments.